Good morning. This morning's lesson is entitled Observations on Life. Text comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 18. Well, 1 through 18, excuse me. Chapter 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. And to the place where whence the rivers come, thither they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new. It hath been already of old time which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that, that shall come after. I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. And I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under the heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of men to be exercised therewith. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun. And behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. I communed with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem, yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And he gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also is vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief. And he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. That's somewhat of a negative way to begin a book. But we'll get to the end of it here in just a moment. So when you consider it, life is a series of mundane events. It's just day after day. You get up, you go to work, you come home and eat supper. Uh, you get ready for bed. You might watch television or whatever. With the occasional burst of activity, something big happens and you deal with it. Now, in police work, they'll tell you that policing is hours of boredom punctuated by moments of sheer terror. When you're chasing somebody into a building and you're, or you're chasing somebody down the highway or somebody's shooting at you, you shoot, or some big sudden thing happens it, like being a paramedic, you sit around waiting for somebody to get into an accident or get into trouble. And there's some nights that you just, you just never sit down except when you're going someplace. You're so busy. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 10 sort of deals with that in a, in a large way. Um, it didn't mark it to this time. Second Peter 3, verses 1 through 10 talks about the... Ending of the world, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first that there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. They forget about the flood. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. He's not covered by time. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which that the heavens that shall in the which in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now I would say if you went back and looked at Genesis chapter six through nine or through, through chapter ten. Those folks weren't expecting a flood, even though Noah had been preaching for 120 years and building the ark, get ready for its coming. He said, oh, nah. They had, as far as we can tell, they had not seen a rainstorm. 
a mist went up from the ground, just, just precipitation and dew. But apparently they'd never had a rainstorm. And he it's going to rain. What? <laughs> it's going to do what? Okay. Beyond their experience. When people are satisfied with their life, it is difficult to interest them in spiritual health. In Luke chapter 14, a, a man, a, a, a great king, gave a great supper and invited just everybody to it. And you read that account, and everybody had an excuse. One fellow said, I bought a piece of land. I have to go look at it. Now, I, I don't know of anybody that's ever bought a piece of land that he hasn't gone to look out yet. Look at yet. I mean, I can't imagine Bradshaw back there going to buy himself a piece of land, buying a piece of land, and say, let's just go take a look at it next week, honey, and see what we bought. No, I don't imagine James doing that. I, I just, he'd probably out there walking around and looking at it and everything else. Uh, I bought a yoke of oxen. I have to go see if they'll plow. I don't think that happens either. And uh, just a number of things happen that people, you know, got in their way. I'm getting married. I've gotten married, and, you know, I can't, I just can't make it. I just, you know, if, if you don't want to do something, one excuse for not doing it is just as good as another. But for those of us with a biblical perspective, there's some lessons to be learned with the vagaries of life. First of all, all of existence is a blessing from God. Everything in this world is a blessing from God. James 1.17, God is the, uh, he's the giver of good gifts. All, thing, all good gifts flow down from him, the father of lights with whom there's no shadow of turning. Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. Uh, it, it, Genesis 1 and verse 31, he said it, it, after he created all things, he saw that it, was very, it wasn't just good, it was very good. And, and everything was there that they needed to make them happy and to satisfy them. They lacked nothing. But things got corrupted in the garden, as you see, as we talked about just briefly in Bible class. Uh, Eve, Eve saw the, the, that fruit tree that it was uh, good to look at, and the fruit was good to taste, and it would make them wise and so forth. At least that's what Satan led them to, the serpent led them to believe. And it was going rapidly downhill from there. Genesis chapter 6, and verse 5, the thoughts of men were evil continually. It was like they stayed up at night trying to figure out what to do next to somebody. And it ended in the flood, Genesis 6 through 9. So, and, and again, it, it was just suddenly, the, the heavens opened up, and the fountains of the deep, the, fountain was bro- the earth was broken up, and the fountains of the deep came rushing out. And it was disastrous. Now, we, you, you look at the, universe, the, the world that we have now, the geography, the geological, you know, you're driving through the mountains, if you're driving through the mountains and you go through a, a, a road that they've cut out of the hillside, you can see the layers of stone. And you can see the layers of stone, not just flat, but they're all bent up and everything else. And sometimes they're laying on top of each other. All that goes back to the, to the, to the flood of Noah. Uh, I saw a film clip where some guys, one guy was a geologist and he was a believer. And he had another fellow with him and they were looking at some, some rock faces out west. And he said, you see this layer of stone here? Yeah. Well, if you test that, that layer of stone isn't from around, it's not native to this area. And, it, and they were out west now. He said, well, where does it come from? He said, about a thousand miles that way, pointing east. So whatever it was, that, that wall of water washed all of that from over here, way, way over there, and then set it down. You ever been walking on the beach, and as you step on the, you're stepping on the sand, and the water kind of squirts up? He showed us that in that layer of dirt, or that layer of rock, where, where the sand had the water had the pressure pushing down had squirted the water up and it fossilized. Now, how does something fossilize that quick? A boatload of pressure. There's, there, there's adequate evidence for a universal flood, not just a local flood, but a universal flood. And I can't imagine a wall of water so powerful that it would wash everything from the east side of the United States to the west side before it finally sets it down. That was a wall of water. Now, in 19, back in 1927, when that levee broke up there where it's now Moon Lake, and that wall of water coming south, that was, that was a mess. I uh, read that book about that, and it was just truly a mess. Yet the world provides sustenance. We've got all that, all that took place, but yet the world provides us. Matthew 5, and verse 45, the sun rises and sets on everybody just equally. In Acts chapter 14, 17, he's given us uh, um, rain in due season. And, and, you know, being here in this agricultural area, it's a pretty big deal. People look forward to that and they're, they're concerned about it. 
Luke chapter 12, 16 and 17, the rich farmer said, I've got me a bumper crop. I just don't know what to do with it all. Now think about these big grain bins out here and that, well, that, that one open bin where they stack all that corn up and then they just put a big sheet of plastic over. That's just beyond me. And, and out here, sometimes out in the fields, you'll see a, a, a big long row of pl a plastic tube where they filled that up with corn. Just amazing to me. I'm glad I came here. <laughs> I've learned a lot. Learned a lot. So it provides sustenance. It's all out there for us to use. It's, this place was designed to be used. Now, we don't have a right to abuse it. I would suggest you can make a case for people that abuse the land. They're facing judgment day for that, but that's a whole other sermon too. But we are blessed as human beings. We are blessed to have not just a part, but an active part in God's design. In Revelation 4 and verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for, there, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are, and were created. All this was created for God's pleasure. God's a creative being. He's a creative individual. That's why all this is. He wanted to be, he wanted to be a parent, if you want to think about it that way. And so that's why we're here. You know, my wife and I have been married, had been married for about four years, and I literally woke up one morning and said, I'm ready for kids. She said, what? <laughs> what? Yes, dear. <laughs> and, you know, it's just one day I, 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 was, I wanted to be a father. I enjoyed being a dad, enjoyed raising my boy. I miss him like, 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 like that. But Ephesians 5, Isaiah 55 and verse 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing wherein I, whereto I send it. So, what that means is, is that God's word can either be a blessing for us or a cursing for us, depending on how we use it. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 28. We've discussed that a number of times. Verses 1 through 4 or 5. If you do what I tell you to do, then here's a bunch of blessings for you, down through about verse 14. And then in verse 15 through, I think it's 68 or 69, there's a boatload of curses. And so his word's going to come back to him one way or the other, it won't be void. It will accomplish one of two things. A whole bunch of blessings for the good folks and a bunch of curses for the not so good folks. So it's, and, and, and we will serve his purpose. We will live the righteous life showing people that it can be done and how to do it. And people will say, you know, I want that. Or people will say, I don't believe those folks. And they'll be condemned by our life on the day of judgment. Well, why didn't you, you watch them? Why didn't you try to live that way? I just didn't think it was real for, or whatever else they're going to say. So God's word won't return unto him void. It will accomplish its purpose. Now, in the second place, we live in the perfect veil of soul making. This physical material universe and the spiritual beings that are populated, me and you, uh, live in that and are part of that perfect veil of soul making. Genesis 1 and verse 31. God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Genesis 8 and verse 20. This is after they've come out of the ark and things have dried out. Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor and the Lord said in his heart, I will not Again, curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. Verse 22 says this. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So, this universe, this material world we live in, will continue to roll along day by day by day, as it always has, and nothing largely will change. The sun's going to come up, the sun's going to, going to go down, the earth is going to spin on its, on its axis and, and, uh, and orbit around the sun, and the galaxies continue rolling along as they always have. Now there's going to be variations. We're going to have earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes and stuff like that. People are going to be born and, uh, and live a healthy life, and then they're going to die. People are going to be born and live a sickly life, and they're going to die. Everybody, everybody passes away from this plane of existence eventually. If, if, if Jesus stays his return, long, his return long enough, our great, great, great grandchildren will one day pass away. 
That's just the way it is. And, and again, I've, I've been in the room where people have died. I've been standing next to them when they passed away, including my own wife. And even though you're expecting it, you know, you know it's getting ready to happen. And when it happens, everybody is shocked. It's just sudden. But that's the way of life. I, and in my funeral sermons, I always include a line, being born into life, dying is just as much a part of life as being born into it is. That which is us still continues on too, by the way, as a matter of fact. But this world is constructed in such a way we can provide for ourselves. Genesis 3, God, in verse 17, 19, God told Adam, almost said Abram, Adam, that you're going to have to till the ground in the sweat of your face. Thorns and thistles, again, you, you know, I'm talking to a bunch of farmers around here, so I, you all know what I'm talking about in that, that line. Um, 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 10, if anyone not work, neither let him eat, so everybody is able to work, ought to be working. Ephesians 4 and verse 28, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him work that which is good with his hands, that he may have to give to others. So again, uh, we've been blessed, you know, with, with prayer over the, over the offering, that God has blessed us, that we can give back to him. Uh, that's what all this is about. That's what all this is for. It's for our benefit. We can use it as we choose to, use it wisely or unwisely, whichever. We're able, and, and the next important part, I say next only because this is the way I listed it, but we are able to reason and draw conclusions. We don't always do that correctly. And frequently we try to avoid reasoning and making a decision because we realize, at least subconsciously, that it may turn out may not turn out the way we want it to. Uh, in Genesis one twenty six, God said, "Let us make man in our image." So we are we are creatures with a spiritual ability that derives from God. So we are able to look at evidence, reason about it correctly, and draw the proper conclusion. About as simple as I can get. I wonder what's going to happen if I stick my finger in that socket over there. I dare you to do it. Somebody does it. And he finds out it don't work that well. It hurts. Don't do that again. Now, that's rather an obvious thing. My son did that when he was just about two years, three years old. He's not done it since. <laughs> he doesn't remember doing it, but he knows enough not to do it again. It hurt. Okay. We, we, we have reasoned. Well, I want to find out what happens. And then they found out what happens. And he says, I'm not doing that again. So... You know, we reason and draw conclusions. Joshua 24, 15, Joshua says, Choose you this day who you will serve. Now, they had a history, a very, very recent history, about a, at least a 40-year history of wandering in the desert. Some of them had a history that went back further than that into Egypt and slavery. So they knew what being a slave was like. They knew what living a reasonably sumptuous life was like. They knew what wandering through the desert was like. They knew the promises of God were being, uh, were being fulfilled. And they, so, there, so therefore they knew what Jehovah, the Lord God Almighty, was like. Although at that point they didn't, they didn't uh, yes, they, did, they knew him by that name at that particular point. So they had, uh, they had an awareness of history and having seen the destruction of, of Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, the Lord descending on the mountain, all the blessings they received while walking in the desert, they had a history with God to draw, to reason about and draw a conclusion from. And it should have been, hey, let's live faithfully so we'll be blessed. This sin thing and this, this cursing thing, no fun. Let's, it hurts. Don't stick your finger in the socket anymore kind of a stuff. Now, you would think that's what they would do. But if you go back and read through there, Every time somebody comes along to lead them out of sin, he says, get rid of your idols. Those folks couldn't leave idols alone from here till Sunday. They just, I don't know, they just couldn't do it. Acts 17 and verse 17, therefore disputed he, Paul, in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met him. So there's this idea of reasoning, of, of dis, now disputed, not yelling and screaming at each other, but sitting down and discussing the issue at hand in a rational way, looking at the facts, drawing the facts together and drawing a conclusion from them. And a lot of folks obeyed. A lot of folks more didn't obey. So we have ample 
evidence from which to reason. Now, again, whether you like the evidence or not is immaterial to the fact of the existence of the evidence. You may not like it. You may say, it, well, that, I don't want to look at all that. That's fine. I, I get that. But that doesn't change reality. Your rejection of reality doesn't change it. It truly doesn't. Romans chapter 1, Paul says, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. It's there. You can look at it. I am wonderfully made, the writer says at one point. For God has showed it unto them. You know, he gave you your body. You know, your body has cycles to it. We can, we can expect certain things. You know, when you get some aspirin, you can expect certain things. Now, some folks are allergic to aspirin, and you don't take it the second or third time. But for the rest of us, we have a pretty good idea that aspirin, you get that aspirin out, whether it's Bear Aspirin or whoever, or St. Joseph's, or whether it's Walmart's brand or whatever, aspirin, salicylic acid is pretty much salicyl salicylic acid. And we know how it's going to react. So we, we take it to get a particular thing. And, and again, there's, there's the evidence that we can reason from if we choose to, because our bodies act, behave in a certain way. It's manifest. For God has showed to them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. What does that mean? Somebody, this, all of this didn't just happen. Now there's folks who say, well, it just, there it was. Well, no. Existence demands an uncaused first cause. It demands, it demands somewhere back there in the distant past, an intellect, a mind, a force, a power, however you choose to describe it, had to exist that was intelligent and said, hey, let's create the universe, or words to that effect. And of course, now everything is, and how he did it, I, I don't know. Uh, if he explained it to me, I probably wouldn't understand it, but that's another thing too. And, and so, so even though he's invisible, we know that, that we have the effect now, what's the cause that brought this about? This building just didn't happen. Somebody had to build this building. Somebody had to, to make the blocks and dig the, all the things that goes along with it. Somebody had to do that. It didn't just happen. But Paul goes on and says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You know, I saw a, a, a video yesterday afternoon, yesterday evening, where about 50 years ago an astronomer, an atheistic astronomer, said that, that there had to be certain conditions to exist for the earth to be as it is. That if those varied in just the tiniest, teeniest, tiny amount, it wouldn't exist. Now, since that time, he has said and about four or five years after that, they came up with another, some more criteria to add to that. And, and now the criteria for existence is hundreds and hundreds of points. That if any one of those was just a little, instead of matching up, it was just teeny tiny off. Your gears wouldn't just grind, your transmission would fall out. It was just that start. And nothing would be. We couldn't, this couldn't be. I mean, our, our garden couldn't exist at all much less change. It just wouldn't be. Why? Because one little bitty ding thing, just slightly off. Top dead center was just another half a degree somewhere bef before or after where it should be. So that's just how precise. And, and that implies order. That implies somebody matching those gears up and setting those things just the way it ought to be. So it couldn't have just happened by accident. Romans 15, 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime are written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are coming. Now, what does that mean? That means that we've got enough evidence that we can stack up out here and look at and reason correctly. Dean talked about it in the Bible class this morning, that that there's folks out there that know stuff about the Bible, they just don't have it in order. They've got 1, 3, 9, 5, 6, 4, 3, 25, instead of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, they've just got them scattered about. Just like playing Yahtzee and you roll those word dice out there and it's just all scattered all over. Well, see, all of this, 
we can pull it together, we can look at it and say, no, this one goes before that one, and, and then these come over here, and we've got some blanks here, and, we'll just, and so you finally get all that stuff lined up just right, and you come up with a solution that matches what you have. That's our universe. That is our human body. You know, it's, it's one thing for an eye to come into existence. It's another thing for two of them to come into existence. And it's yet a whole other operation for them to come together at the same time and same place. And then you've got to have some place to put them. Okay? And, and get them to match up in the right place. All these little bitty tiny little things have to come. There we go back to our gears coming together one more time. You might have an eyeball, and if you don't have a skull, if it's still another 10,000 years in the future before that skull comes into existence, you got an eyeball just hanging out. It's going to dry out. It ain't going to work. So it all has to be together at the right time and the right place. So we are able to live in any fashion we choose. God has constructed us in this universe in such a way that we can do pretty much what we decide to do. Now, there's consequences. There's always consequences. You know, I can, uh, when I had that, that truck I had, I could shift that thing however I want. I could use the clutch or not use the clutch. It's better when you use the clutch. It works better. It works better. And, and, and it works when you get the gears in right order, too. Okay, I found that out. A that, that, long time ago, I found that out before I got that truck. But nevertheless, um, Ephesians 2, Paul says, And you hath he quickened who were dead, past tense, and trespass and sin. So you were living a particular way. You had a particular kind of lifestyle, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in children of disobedience. There's a lifestyle there. Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, by course of action, the children of wrath. We had a lifestyle. We lived a particular way on how we felt we ought to live. And we did the things we thought we ought to do. And it was generally wrong. She said, come unto me, all you labor heavy laden, I'll give you rest. You know, we've got to come where he is to get the blessings he has to offer. So in the third place, all are subject to the common concerns of this existence. Now, this may come as a shock to some folks, but none of us are privileged. I know. I, that's a shock, isn't it? You're going to get sick. You may not get as sick as some other people do. And you may not die until you're 93 or 106. But you will die. You will die. That's, that's just the way of it. That's just life. That's, that's just part of being existence. Evil takes place and tragedies happen. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus is talking to the Jews and he says, There were present at that season that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now, we don't know exactly what happened, but apparently there are some folks going down to the temple to offer sacrifices, and, and uh, 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 Pilate came in there and, some, for some fashion, killed them with their sacrifices. Now, why he did what he did, we, don't, we have no explanation. Just that's what he did. Why did he do it? Well, I don't know. Pretty, uh, not a nice guy. In verse 4, he says, Of these eighteen upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? Well, they must have done something wrong or God wouldn't have punished them. That's the way they thought back then. Folks still think that way today. I heard of a congregation, and I think it was the Church of Christ, out in Texas years ago. It had been snowing, and the roof caved in and killed a bunch of folks during services. <gasps> God judged them. No. Well, then what happened? Well, the roof gave way. It had snow on it. Killed a bunch of folks. It's called reality. It happens. Bridges go out. Okay? Okay? Things happen. All, you go on YouTube, you look, type in disasters, you'll find all kinds of terrible stuff. People driving down the road, you see on the dash cam, here comes a tree, falls across their car. Driving down the road, and here comes a landslide, washes the car off in front of them. Stuff happens. Things, life just goes on. It is just the way it is, and it and, and doesn't matter who you are. You know, you, well, you think you're leading a charmed life, and then the doctor says, you've got six months, or you've got two weeks, or whatever. Or your, your banker calls and says, you've been wiped out. You know, things happen, and nobody's exempt from it. Sickness and death happen to the righteous, 
Uh, Acts 9 and verse 36, Dorcas passed away. We talked about her in Bible class this morning, a good, good faithful Christian woman doing good deeds, and she got sick and died. How could that happen to Sister Dorcas? I, why would God do that? Well, who said he did? Well, then why did it happen? Oh, she got sick and died. Well, why didn't he stop it? Why would he pick her out and not somebody else? You know, why did my wife get pancreatic liver cancer and die? Well, I mean, I, she's a good, pretty good person, I thought. Why did God allow that? Well, he didn't allow it to happen. Well, why didn't he stop it? Well, he'd have to stop it. If he did it for my wife, then he'd have to do it for somebody else. Why would he single her out? Other than the fact, she was my wife. I mean, but I'm not going to argue with him about it. I'll see her one day soon anyways. Philippians chapter 2, Epaphroditus was a faithful uh, a member of Paul's team. He had, he had brought uh, an offering from the brethren of Philippi and, and to come to minister to Paul. And he got sick and near to, nearly died. Wow, oh, he's a... Why, how do, and we all get upset. Hey, it's called L-I-F-E. It's called life. It's not what happens to us, it's how we deal with it. You know, life can knock you off your feet, just don't wall around in the dirt, get up and dust yourself off and go about your business. I would suggest this in regards to things like that, as devastating as that was. The best thing I can do is show somebody else how you live, a, uh, how you get through it. I'm not saying I'm good through it yet, don't, don't misunderstand me at all. Because there's still nobody singing in my right ear. I, I was thinking about, I listened to y'all sing a little while ago, and I thought about that too. I, that just hit me. Just, man, I wish that would quit, but <laughs> that's part of life too, I suppose. Number four, how do we live with both great tragedy and the daily grind? How do we do that? Well, recognize that God is still on his throne and knows the details of our lives. Well, I have not gotten a phone call or a letter or a birthday card, anything from him. Well, I mean, I've got this, but, you know, I've not gotten a personal communication. Gene, it's, it'll work out. I've not gotten that from him at all. I don't expect it. If it happens, I'll give you a call and ask you about it, but I don't expect it to happen. Psalms 11, verse 4, the writer says, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes, behold, his eyes try the children of men. And Matthew 10 are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore ye are of more value than many sparrows. God knows about you. You can't go anywhere without him knowing about it and do anything without him being aware. He knows what you're doing. He knows what you're thinking. He tries the range of your heart. You're not alone. Now it gets quiet. Sure does. It's lonely sometimes, it sure does. But he knows what's going on in your life. Um, knowing that I'll see her again and knowing that the Lord hears my prayers when I pray to him. I would suggest you do those two things. If, nothing, if you don't do anything else today, do that. He blesses the faithful. Hebrews 5 verse 9, Being made perfect, he came the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Be thou faithful unto death, I give unto thee the crown of life. You know, Paul talked about the crown of righteousness that was waiting for him. Again, Revelation 2 and verse 10, Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give unto thee the crown of life. In other words, it does, it's, it's not material. What happens to you is not material to your eternal destiny unless you let it knock you down and keep you down. Get up, dust yourself off, and be on about your father's business. There's a vineyard to work in. And, and take note of the fact that as wonderful as your precious little heart is, you're not any better than anybody else is. So you've got life to live. I just suggest you get up and live it. As hard as it is sometimes. He tempts no one with evil. James 1 and verse 13 let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Well, losing your spouse is about as bad as it can get, unless it's losing your children. And what, and what do you do? You get up and you go on. That's what you do. That's what you do. God didn't make that happen. God, God didn't cause that to happen. He's provided a plan which, when followed, leads us to the heavenly home. 
And I think here, as I said in the Bible class this morning, the, the gospel is about as practical a plan of operation as you can get. Matthew 7, Jesus says, enter ye in at the straight gate. Well, how do you find that gate? That, that's part of the process. <coughs> for, excuse me. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So, so you need to be about your father's business and seeing what's what and what you need to do. And be very specific. John 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter into the second time in his mother's womb and be born? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Jesus said, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Well, we need to find out what that is and then do that. Colossians, Paul says, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, in heaven, where have ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel? So the thing is, is, is it's there for us to read and study and to know about and then to apply in our lives, and it is, it is, a, life, it is a lifelong effort. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, again, we mentioned it in Bible class this morning, and hereby we do know that we know him if, notice the conditional statement, if we keep his commandments. And he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Well, I don't have to do anything to go to heaven. Well, that's, then you're a liar, the Holy Spirit says. You don't argue with the Holy Spirit about that one. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected, hereby know we that we are in him. Well, you believe in your work and your way to heaven. Well, Jesus said that belief in him is a work. John chapter 6, 28 and 29. This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. If you believe in Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, you believe in work. By the way, he is a personal Savior. Galatians 2 and verse 20. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. That, he, that Christ had died for, G, for Paul. Well, that's personal. You can't get more personal than that. Not necessarily in a sense that most folks out there in the world think about it. Oh, one other passage, I, I promise. John chapter, no, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. If you read the book of Ecclesiastes, don't lose heart. <laughs> There's some parts of that book just absolutely just negative, just almost depressing. I tried this, and it didn't work. I tried that, and it didn't work. I just was miserable for a while. So here's my conclusion, the writer says. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. If we live the faithful Christian life, he has promised to save us in the end. Every day, for, uh, for those that trust in God, the important thing to remember is that we are always able to determine what our spiritual standing is. And that's where 1 John 2, 3 comes in. Every day, moment by moment, we decide what our course of action will be. Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So if I hear the gospel, John 6, 40, 40, John 6, 44 and 45, I believe that Jesus is the Christ by hearing the gospel, John 8 and verse 24. I'm willing to confess him before men, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Repent of my sins, excuse me, I got that backwards. Repent of my sins, Luke 13, 3, and then confess him as Lord, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Be baptized for remission of my sins, Mark 16, 16, what Jesus said, and then faithful unto death, Revelation 2 and verse 10, he's promised to save me in the end. Now, if you've, if you've, done those, if you've not done those things, you need to do them, because that's how you're going to see the kingdom of God, if and only if, John chapter 3, 3 through 5. If you are a child of God, but you've been unfaithful, you've left, away a path, path, left the pathway of righteousness, we beg you to come back. We can pray for you. Let us know. You study with you. I open, open our Bibles and find Bible questions to uh, Bible answers to Bible questions and stuff. Then let's do that. If you need to respond to the invitation of Christ, we invite you to come. All together, we stand and sing the invitation.